I'm we'll spending a little time in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I love the Gospel of Mark. It is an incredible action movie of the life of Jesus. And for a lot of centuries in the realm of biblical scholarship, it was a neglected gospel for a variety of reasons. Uh, but within the last uh, decades, it has become um, something of interest among scholars. And one of the things that sparked that interest was the idea of looking at the Gospel of Mark the way we might look at a mystery novel. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read many novels or read many uh, mystery stories. Uh, there's always a temptation, I think, in reading s stories that are very intriguing to flip to the end to see how it ends so that you'll know the outcome. Uh, mysteries are very intriguing. They, they have always been and will probably always remain one of the most interesting types of literature in the world. I think about, um, you know, just mystery, the mystery genre that I, I kind of grew up with. I love Humphrey Bogart movies, and, you know, Bogey used to be in a lot of those kinds of movies, The Maltese Falcon. Um, my kids grew up watching Nancy Drew. I can remember, you know, years ago, my folks watching Murder, She Wrote, and my wife and I have gained a new appreciation of Columbo reruns. Um, and my wife is undefeated at the board game Clue. And one of these days, one of us is going to defeat her, but we still have not done so. But mysteries, they're very intriguing. The mystery that surrounds the Gospel of Mark is this question. Who is Jesus? What is his identity? When you look in the Gospel of Mark, you see, very interestingly, the mystery begin to unfold. And so let's, let's allow our own fingers to do the walking through the Gospel of Mark, and let's see how the story lines itself out. When you get to chapter 1, uh, the first line tells you the identity of Jesus and, and gives you a hint at it. And then when you get down to verse 11, and we have the baptism of Jesus, uh, we have this repeated, that, that Jesus is declared by the Father from heaven to be his beloved Son. And so we as readers, we're in on the secret. We're in on the answer. We know from the outset the mystery. It's like one of those mystery movies, like, for example, a Columbo where you, you as the viewer, you see the murder happen at the beginning, and now the rest of the movie is just about everybody else trying to figure out what happened in the beginning. And so we as the readers, we are let in on the secret at the beginning. Line one, he is the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 11, you are my beloved Son. God the Father speaks from heaven. But nobody else in the book seems to know this answer, and so it remains a mystery. So when we drop down in chapter 1 to verse 23, it says, Immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. So now we're dealing with the realm of evil, evil spiritual beings. Verse 24, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is really surprising because here we have a spiritual evil being who is in on the secret identity of Jesus while the crowd still seems to have no idea about him. When we get over into chapter 2, we're progressing in the mystery, and we get down into verse 7, the whole setting is, you know, the crowds are outside a house where Jesus is healing some people, and they can't get a guy inside who really needs to be healed by Jesus, so they break through the roof, they lower him down in the midst of them, and Jesus decides, this is my moment when I'm going to declare this man's sins forgiven. And to prove that he has the authority to do that, he still heals the man. And the people react to this. The religious elite seems to react to this very, very negatively. Verse 7 says, why does he speak like this? He is blaspheming because who can forgive sins except... God alone. <laughs> Who indeed? 
And so they're saying, we never, we've never seen anything like this. This would be blasphemy if it weren't true. And so what kind of man can say these words and do these things? And so the mystery continues. We get down to chapter 2, verse 16. And so now we encounter the religious elite, the scribes and the Pharisees. And they, you know, they're asking, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Of all people, why in the world would Jesus go to the people who need to be converted and spend time with the lost? You know, what kind of person would ever do such a thing? And so the mystery continues. And so then there comes to sort of this, <clears throat> this moment where the religious elite is very, very offended by him. Uh, they don't know how to take him. They see the things that he does. They can't deny those things. And so what they do in verse 22 is they try to explain his powers away by saying he is possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And that's how he casts out demons. And so they're in absolute denial. And the mystery of the true identity of Jesus, though it's known to us by the reader, as readers, the mystery of the people in the story, it continues. By the time we get over into chapter 4, we find Jesus in this particular instance He's on a boat, and he's in a boat with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is notorious for having these intensely powerful storms swell up. And in this instance, it's threatening to capsize the boat. And the disciples are terrified that they're about to die, and they look over at their fearless leader, and he's asleep at the helm. And they go and they wake him up. And like children who complain to their parents saying, you don't really love us, do you? They look at him and they say, do you even care that we're dying? And Jesus just stands up and he speaks to the water and to the wind and to the storm and says, be still. And it becomes like glass, smooth. In verse 41 Rather than the disciples jumping up and down in the boat and saying three cheers for Jesus, it says they were actually filled with greater fear and began to question one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The mystery. And so chapter 6 comes along, verse 14, and we find the man in power amongst the people, King Herod. And it is said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. And verse 16 says, but when Herod heard all of this, he said, this is John whom I beheaded, and he's back from the dead. So now we have even governmental officials who are starting to wonder, who is this guy? You know, the, the, the question's at a fever pitch at this point. And so now... The Gospel of Mark has been building and building and building and the tension building. Who is he? Who is he? Who is he? And so now we come to the centerpiece of Mark in chapter 8, where Jesus is walking along the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He's on the border of good and evil. He's on the border of, of all of this Gentile territory, the territory of evil spiritual beings. And before he enters it, he looks at his disciples and he says, Who do you say that I am? Peter gives an answer. And it's a right answer. He says, You are the Christ, Christos, from the Hebrew idea of Mashiach, the anointed one, ultimate prophet, ultimate priest, ultimate king. You are our promised king. And he's right. The problem is it's just not the whole answer because Jesus is about to tell him what this Christ figure really is going to be like and what he's going to do. Now, this is an interesting section in Mark because here's where geography actually informs our doctrine, our theology. Because now what we see is from the moment this declaration is made that you are the Christ, we see Jesus set his face in the direction of Jerusalem. And he takes this zigzag pattern down a, a map. If you look at a Bible map, he goes from town to town, but he is headed steadily 
southward, southeast, to be in, to be accurate, and he's headed toward Jerusalem. And he's doing that because of what he said to Peter is going to be the full duty of the Messiah. Mark 10 gives us uh, an insight into that full task. Mark 10, 45 says, even the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite identity title he gives to himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and here it is, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so by the time that the tide of public opinion and religious authority has fully turned against him, and once in dead, chapter 14, verses 61 and 62 says, the high priest asked him, are you indeed then the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And, that's not all, not only am I Christ, but here's the full, fuller picture. You will see the Son of Man. Now, let's pause a minute. The Son of Man in Daniel 7 is this divine figure who approaches the throne of the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And he ascends to that throne, and he takes his seat at the right hand of the Ancient of Days, and he is given a kingdom that lasts forever with no ending. He's a divine being. And so here Jesus says this Christ is not just a, an arriving king like David. He is the son of man figure. He blends the two ideas and gives a fuller answer to what his task will be. He says, I am, I am the Christ, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And of course, they, they knew what he meant, that he was identifying himself this way. And they tore their robes and declared death. For him. And that brings us to a tragic scene, but necessary one in the plan of God. Chapter 15, verse 39. And here we have the death of Jesus, and we have a centurion, a Roman centurion, standing there. And he stood facing him, and he saw how Jesus died, and he breathed his last, and the centurion say, says, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And so now, finally, we have the full identity of Jesus revealed. And we have this declaration by this Roman centurion standing at the foot of the cross, proclaiming this man to be the Son of the Most High. So Mark's Gospel has been progressing us little by little, asking who is Jesus, and now we come to our answer, our answer in chapter 15, verse 39, and we stand next to a centurion in the story, looking up at the dying Jesus, declaring with the centurion that he is indeed the Son of God. Well, we sort of need this whole story to, to give the full identity of Jesus, and, and he's declared to be Son of God. And I think that's very important because Son of God is a divine title. It's a royal title, and it means he is the great king and that this is a title bestowed upon him by Almighty God. Son of God in the Old Testament was a title that meant Israel's king, Psalm 2 and verse 7, for example. And so here it takes on even greater meaning because Jesus, what this means is, that Jesus is king. He is the Son of God. He is God's king being sent into the world. And he's being sent into the world because he is the rightful ruler of God's world. He is the king of Israel. He is God's Messiah. He is our rescuing king because now the, the world is under the sway of the God of this world, the devil and all of his minions, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And Jesus now is the rescuing king who's come to invade and to take over. And so as God's ruler, Jesus intends to rescue all of his followers. He brings blessings to all who belong to him, and he brings in full life as God intended it to be. And so, as we close this lesson in this simple overview of the Gospel of Mark, may we stand shoulder to shoulder, 
with the centurion at the foot of the cross. And may we also look up at Jesus and say, truly this man was the Son of God. In Jesus' name, His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we enter.